Greetings and welcome to In Depth. I'm DK Rasta. When Calypso Rose released Abatina, many persons may have been singing the laugh way without realizing we were getting a timeline of domestic violence. And I wanted to start with that jump off point while speaking about domestic violence and outreach programs to address them with domestic violence with two women making a difference. Carletta Figaro, founder director of She Chose Life Foundation, and Laverne Gordon, founder and president of Love Life Now Foundation. Welcome, ladies. I want to thank you so much for making the time. And I want to start off with you, please, Laverne, in terms of giving us a, di a definition of domestic violence. Absolutely. Many people, and first of all, thank you for having me. Um, many people often think that the term domestic violence refers to the physical hitting or punching or kicking of someone where there's contact. Oftentimes, they don't understand that this issue uh, surrounds many areas of what is considered abuse, and that is mental and emotional and verbal and financial, just to name a few forms of what this issue entails. And it, it, it circumvents and surrounds the, the physical uh, and emotional and mental um, power and control over someone else, whether it be an intimate partner or a family member that is close to you. Once you have an intimate partner relationship or are, are close to someone enough that they can exert power and control over you, it is considered domestic violence. Thank you so much. And I want to continue on that point of control, asking the question, if there are all these things that are happening, uh, Carletta, why not try to mm. remove yourself or move away from that situation? What are some of those things that have individuals coming back to a situation like that where they are experiencing domestic violence? Um, I would not say love. Sometimes it is loyalty. You're in a relationship and in your mind, you are in it for the long haul. But that long haul doesn't mean that you need to stay and be abused or take abuse. Right. So basically, it's a sense of loyalty that something has to happen, something drastic for persons to wake up and say, OK, I've had enough. There yeah. has to be a wake up call for a person to say, I have had this is it. I'm leaving. I, Other than I that. Mm -hmm. I will agree, Coletta. I will agree to that end um, mm -hmm. that it, people do have to get to a breaking point for them to want mm -hmm. to leave. But there are mm -hmm. also so many other reasons that uh, people end up staying in these relationships and the gamut runs wide. It could be financial. It could be uh, children. Oh, right. It could be a housing situation where if they leave, mm -hmm. they become homeless. It could be uh, being ostracized from community if you decide to out the perpetrator. There's so many reasons why victims end up staying, but I, I really, you know, what we focus on at Love Life Now Foundation is awareness and prevention around this issue. And what we try to incite is that the narrative has to change. The, the question should not be why do victims end up going back on average seven to 10 times, which is what it takes for victims to leave. Yes, but definitely. the question should be is how do we hold abusers accountable for their actions? How do we seek to help them? Because just as victims who are brainwashed, as you can, you want, you, some people might say, or are mentally wrapped up in the idea that abuse is correct or normal, or, or, or something that they belong in. Um, it's the same way that abusers have learned this behavior too from, from others around them, whether it be their community or their parents, the same way victims believed as such uh, as well coming up. So um, how do we get them help? How do we hold them accountable for what they've done? And how do we, again, create awareness to, uh, for others to understand that what is going or happening with them isn't right? And I guess that also carries me back to this song that I started off with in terms of Abatina, where there's a line where she's saying, we were not inclined to believe her. And so that, that silencing that can happen by a person silencing themselves because they're afraid of what may happen 
or a, a family, just no man, we, 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 we carry it to the pastor, we have a counselor for something like that to take place, or even the wider community saying, like you, like you said, Laverne, this is something that can be normalized. But yes. looking at perpetrators, do you think it is possible for abusers to change Carletta? There is a possibility that someone who is abusive could change, but that is like one out of a hundred in my from in my because I think once somebody is into abuse, so once somebody's abusive, it takes a it takes a whole lot for that person to change. It takes God for that person to change, that divine intervention. So for me, I would the first time you're abused, there is a possible I would say run, but then you, you see counseling. And if the counseling doesn't work and that abuse happens again, you people need to leave and know that it would not get any better. I don't yeah. see any way of it getting any better. It yep, happened the I... first time. If you didn't leave that time, you, you seek counseling. If that person doesn't want counseling, leave. Because it, it, it's not never going to get any better, just worse. Absolutely. I, I again, agree, Carletta. Um, it takes mm -hmm. two uh, for any relationship to work or not work. Right. And so uh, when one person who is the power and controlling person um, has decided that this is what they want to do, it isn't because I drank so much and, you know, now I'm drunk and I hit you by mistake or I used drugs and I'm high and I decided that this is what was going to happen. They are choosing to do this to you. So if they did it once, they absolutely will do it again. You cannot sit around and think that at some point, the person that you fell in love with who presented a very uh, uh, misleading facade to make you think that they were one way, and then you know, you're thinking at some point that person is going to reappear after that person hits you or verbally abuses you or emotionally puts you down or mentally warps you, please know mm -hmm. that it is 99% positive that they will do it again. They have to want to make a change, right? Um, just like you wanting to leave because you've had enough, they have to see that what their actions have done has caused harm. And then they have to seek the help to get it themselves. You can't stay around and help them change. No amount of licks, as they say in Trinidad, um, mm -hmm. that you take will make them want to change. And a lot of the times victims are sticking around for that. They're thinking, if I cry enough, if they see the children hurting enough, if anything enough, this will make a change. And it just is not, that's not the case. And, and on that note, we, and, how weak you are. and on that note, we take More a short like break, ladies. I, 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 want, I want to go back to the point of choice. I want to raise it when we return from the break. Stay with us. We return with so much more. Welcome back. We are going in depth on domestic violence and the Love Over Everything project. It states that conflict is inevitable. Violence is a choice. We are speaking with Carletta Figaro, founder of She Chose Life Foundation, and Laverne Gordon, founder of Life Now Foundation. And I want to ask about choice and the importance of choice both in the abuser and the abused ladies. Because even looking at the names of the programs that you all have founded, she chose life, as well as Love Life Now Foundation. So not some time down the road. It's a proactive thing and it's, it's, it's a very active sort of statement. But tell me, from, from, your, from your point of view, what's the importance, what's, what's, what's the impact of choice? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in here, Carletta, but, um, you know, ultimately, and I, and I have to go back before I even go to the point of choice, as we're talking about now. And when I say go back, I have, I mean, between victims and abusers backgrounds and where they come from, right? Oftentimes, victims and abusers learn this behavior, right? They've seen it modeled by parents uh, and their communities. And and when they get to an age where they're very susceptible to, you know, outside uh, forces and then their own choice, right, as we're talking about choice, 
this is where it begins to play out or that behavior begins to play out or not. And oftentimes that's around the 13 to 14 year old mark, right? Where they're now having these young teen relationships. And, you know, again, this is the way I know how to love. I know how to love by yelling at my partner. I know how to love um, by pushing my partner and getting respect. I know how to love by controlling my, my partner's whereabouts and the way that they dress because that's what I've seen modeled. Children get their first uh, approaches of, about what their adult relationships will look like from their parents and their communities. And this, in the same regard, so do victims. victims Oftentimes, they're watching, sometimes their mothers go through abusive relationships and seeing that mommy is receiving this abusive behavior, whether it be pushing or verbally put, being put down or being controlled about where they're supposed to go. So they believe inherently when they get to the 13, 14 year old stage, when somebody comes at them with that, that that's normal, right? And so, but as we get older, Right now we're 18, 19, we're in college or we're off somewhere going to a different you know, area school or whatever. Now you have choice. Now you have a mindset where it's like, do I continue this? Because now I, I have an outside sort of set of forces around me where I know better, I should do better, but I'm choosing to continue with what I know. And so again, it's it's a choice, regardless of the way you look at it, victim or abuser. Um, it's just how you get unraveled from that is the is the case once you get involved in these types of relationships. All right, and I want to and ask you your, 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 yours as well, please, Carletta, and I also ask you to continue and give us an idea of your foundation and why why you chose to say, okay, well, this is something that I'm going to create. Okay, um, she chose life was booted. Um, it came to me unexpected in the sense that um, there was an incident where there were two babies found at the, at the Beatham landfill. And I remember I saw it and when I saw it, it was so heartbreaking to see two full term baby that was born alive and left to die in a cardboard box and placed in the dump. And I would wonder, it made me wonder, why would somebody carry two babies, not one, but two babies, beautiful babies, they're born alive and you leave them to die. At least try to give them up. At least say I can't afford or something. And I was wondering, it's probably that person didn't have the resources to take care of the baby after they were born. Or they probably, you know, you have to go to the hospital. You're not seeing nothing coming. You're not seeing the father not around, you don't know where to turn. So I I didn't know what did I remember. I cried a lot. I prayed about it. And that is when the Lord gave me She Chose Life Foundation, which I think was for me because my mommy died when I was two. And um, I grew up without a mom. And uh, to be honest, I don't want to hurt anybody's feeling. I was told by my stepfather, he said no, and more than one person, that I was baby number eight. And my my mommy got pregnant with baby number nine and that she had bought to that baby. I do not, I was not there. I, I, I do not want to hurt anybody's feeling, but this is what I was told by my stepfather. And he also told me if I ever get pregnant, I do not know what to do, come to him, he would help me. So on that day, I actually went to the She Chose Life Foundation where the Lord actually told me exactly what to do and how to do it and from then on, I started packing the bundles. I started to reach out to friends and family who had a baby. The, the, the baby ran through these things very fast. So they are practically in brand new condition. They are pre-loved, right? Not used, pre-loved because they are in mint condition that you could go back to the hospital and use it. Somebody else could use it. So I started gathering this stuff and I would go to Pennywise and buy the baby oil, um, Modest, Everything that is on the that I could afford that is on the baby list because I am not funded in any way. It is something that I do from my heart, from this lady to somebody else, right? Um, and that is how I started the foundation. Really, that is why I started. She chose life. So once you choose to bring life, to give life, you have somebody who's willing to stand up with you and assist. Whatever I have at the time, I will give to you. But you cannot say that you came and you didn't get. If you didn't get something happen that we probably lose communication, 
But once you keep in communication, we have you on that list. Once you need help and you qualify for help, but this is another problem that we are having. We try to help as much people as possible, prepare to welcome baby with the essentials that baby could start life comfortably. And you, you're saying that, and I have my, my pause raising, and I'm thinking about the widow's might. So sometimes it's not the it's not the quantity, but the fact that you're finding the wherewithal to do what you can, and that makes so much more of an impact. Laverne, I see you nodding your head. Give me a little backstory into Love Life Now Foundation. Thanks. Gosh, and and, and I'm with you um, on pause being raised because every time Carletta talks about her story and you know where the the passion came from to do this work that's what it is right it's passion work that you know you cannot discount and so love life now is you know comes from that same sort of passion where you know i i, I talk about this issue so much and you know it's such a you know driving force for me because i too come from um the forces that drove me here uh, which is domestic violence i grew up in trinidad um i lived there for 15 years um, and had migrated to the states for high school and unfortunately for the 15 years that i lived there our father brutally abused our mother we lived in laventil proud laventilian here and um you know unfortunately it, not just in our house but other houses that i grew up around back in the 80s i was born in 77 but knew myself in the 80s around that time every other house was abusing their partner and again this was completely normal i mean it, it, it saddened me and it hurt me and it infuriated me watching my mom go through um, what she went through with our dad um, because it was brutal attacks that he did not hide uh, in the house, in front of our house. And so I always said that that would never be me, that I would never let anybody treat me the way my father treated our mother. And unfortunately, again, children that grow up in abusive homes, they, uh, they tend to go on to become abusers themselves or victims, and I was no exception. I became a victim um, at the age of 21. At the time, I was uh, going to school uh, at a university in Boston, and uh, then, uh, you know, working entry level in corporate America. Um, and again, thought I had everything sort of mapped out for me as to where my life was headed. Um, uh, but again, unfortunately, I, I, I looked at myself as somebody that could never encounter this issue because my mother was the opposite. She was uneducated at the time mm. for the dad. She was uh, mm. financially dependent on our father and I was the total opposite. And so unfortunately, I didn't see the beginning of my parents' relationship. So I didn't know what the red flags were. I missed all of that when, they, you know, when they started out. So for me, when the red flags came in the, in the abuser that I, uh, you proceeded to date at 21, um, it was missed. It was subdued. It was, oh gosh, that's nothing. I'm going to just dismiss that. Even though my intuition and my gut is yelling at me, I'm going to dismiss that because everything else is great about him, right? Um, I'm just going to continue down this road. Oh, and he slapped me for the first time three months into the relationship. You know what? I'll find a way to forgive him, you know, because he's apologizing with flowers and he's remorseful in the tearful um, apology that he's giving over the phone. And he's saying that it'll never happen again. What do you do with that at 21? You, you believe it, right? And so, you know, by the time the next attack came, it was because it was full on attack, right? And at that point, the second time around, it's like, all right, this is what love is. This is what I've watched my mom go through it. Now I'm going through it. I don't have a name for it. But this is what is supposed to happen until my breaking point and decided that I had had enough. That place that victims have to get to if they decide to leave. But you'll but you'll talk but you'll talk about breaking point and having to leave. Uh, that actually brings us to the the time that we have for this conversation. Of course, we don't have enough time to get into everything that we would like to. But ladies, we want to thank you so much for the work that you are doing. Uh, the She Chose Life Foundation, as well as the Love Life Now Foundation, Laverne Gordon and Coletta Figaro. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, this has been In Depth With Me, DK Ronstadt. Thank you so much for joining us.